that it had, the poor quality of the wines. Even during the monastic period, uh, the quality can't been, have been very good. For the reason that chemistry and biochemistry had not yet come on the scene. And it's just a hundred years and a little more that um, we have uh, brought the wine industry into the modern world. The scientific revolution started at the beginning of the 19th century with the discovery of the chemical elements and so forth and was applied first to the wine industry starting in the late 1850s by Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was a chemist to start with. He became a microbiologist, a biochemist, an immunologist, and uh, practically a medical doctor when he was working with some medical diseases. Um, he gave us several things that have changed the wine industry completely. First of all, he said that the, the, what was making the fermentation go had something to do with the yeast, that it was not due to some chemical theory as they had believed in non-vital theory as they had believed in Germany at that period, but that it had something to do with the activities of yeast. And you've already had that part with Dr. Singleton. Second, uh, he said that the diseases of wine were due to specific microorganisms. And third, that these microorganisms might be aerobic, that is oxygen loving, or anaerobic, avoiding oxygen. And I think you've had those. And so in the last hundred years, the the spoilage, the chancy nature of the wine industry has gotten less and less. You are a very lucky generation. You are living now in the golden age of wine. There are more great wines produced today than at any time in the history of the world. A greater percentage of the wine is great wines today than ever before in the history of the world. And a far, far greater percentage of the wines are drinkable. Spoilage is rare, it's exceptional. It's very hard to find, particularly in this country and, uh, say, Germany and the more developed countries in Europe, uh, so, and South Africa and Australia and other places in the world, too, as far as that's concerned. So that we've had a revolution in the wine industry, starting with Louis Pasteur, his publication of his studies on wine in 1861, and continuing down right till today. And I predict that you'll be even luckier uh, I'll be dead and gone, but uh, you'll be drinking the good wines that are being made today. You'll be drinking wines of the new varieties that are being planted today, and you'll be drinking them presumably in America where there's going to be more good wines because we are now in the process of accumulating the largest collection of fine variety vineyards of any country in the world. Uh, a very big uh, revolution is going on right here in California, right under our noses, right now, this year and last year. And that is bound to have a very big impact on the future wine industry. So uh, you can write down in your books 25 years from today when you're drinking those 10-year-old Cabernet Sauvignons, been well-aged, and uh, you're having a great big roast beef, not a synthetic uh, piece of soya meat or something like that. Well, Amarine predicted this is what was going to happen in, uh, in uh, 1990. Uh, see, 25 years from today would be 1998, I guess, something like that just before the year 2000. Just when you have the time and leisure and the, the money to afford good wines, your, your generation is going to have the best wines that any generation ever had. And you already have the best selection of any generation in the past. More people can afford wines today than ever before and probably well in the future. All right, now we've taken up the question of France and why should we be studying France for a whole lecture, uh, giving up time from other parts of the world and giving up time from the United States as far as that's concerned. Well, first of all, it's not the largest producer of wine. It's the second largest. Italy is the largest producer of wine. But it produces more unique and distinctive types than Italy produced, and generally speaking, at a higher quality level. So it's worth studying for that reason alone. Uh, there are more distinctive types of wine produced in, in France than in any other country. 
As proof of that statement, just look at the number of types of French wine that have been copied by other countries. Champagne, Sauternes, Chablis. All of these are names of districts in France, and every other country in the world has been copying these names because of the prestige of the French names. Um, another reason, they're the biggest importer of wines in the world. They're also the largest exporter of wines in the world. They're also the largest consumer of wines in the world. Every man, woman, and child in France consumes every year a little bit over 30 gallons of wine. Now, considering that some children don't drink their proportionate share, and other people for illness and other reasons don't drink their proportionate share, that means that the people who do drink have to do very well indeed. They have to drink the equivalent of about a gallon a week, which means they have to get into at least a, almost a bottle a day. And considering that some days you don't want to drink and some days it snows and things like that, why that means that on certain days you have to be especially good at drinking. Um, the French do this by having a little glass of wine in the morning, having a little wine for lunch, and having some more wine with their dinner. Uh, and they do this uh, the year round. There are other reasons why we should study France, I think, because it's the country that has had the critical attitude toward wines for perhaps longer than any other country. The French, uh, even under the, the Louis, the great Louis and so forth, in the 17th century, uh, they considered the wine industry of France to be a part of the patrimony of the country, that it was one of the things that France was best known for, not just that it was best known for that, but it was one of the best things to be known for. That, that wine was a part of every Frenchman's soul. And that continues down till today. I told the story before, and it's still true. France, since the war, has had a succession of political crises. And one of the most brilliant members or premiers that they had was a man by the name of Mondes Franz. Those of you who are reading French history, he was well trained, he had a brilliant mind, he was a genius at financial things, and uh, yet his government was brought down. It was brought down by a combination of communists, of monarchists, of middle of the roaders to the left and middle of the roaders to the right, and true middle of the roaders. It was brought down because he said that the children of France should drink milk, not wine. And that was treasonous as far as the French was concerned, and they knocked his government out. It was one of the few cases in which the left and the right have agreed since World War II on French politics, showing that the wine industry of France really is a part of every Frenchman. Before World War I, it's estimated that one out of every seven Frenchmen was connected directly or indirectly with the alcoholic beverage industries, of which wine industry is by far the largest in France. All right, we'll start then with uh, the upper corner of France, Alsace, uh, not a very large area, greatly subdivided among a lot of little people, was German from 1870 to 1918. How many people have been at the Place de Concorde in Paris? What do you see in the Place de Concorde, besides automobiles nowadays? and the American flag over at one corner. <coughs> it's got a big fountain, or it's got a, not a fountain, it's got an Egyptian obelisk in the middle, like the Place Vendôme. You can look across the river at the Chamber of Deputies on the other side. But around the whole thing, which you can hardly see anymore because they made a parking lot out of it, are uh, 11 allegorical statues to the provinces, the pre-Napoleon provinces of France. Each of them, like the province that included the end of the Loire, this province in here, it has fish and lobster and oysters because that's the big industry of that area. And different areas, pretty near all the areas at least have some grapes and a bottle of wine or just grapes. And many of them have wheat and so forth because grain is grown all over France. And Alsace-Lorraine uh, has grapes in the woman's arm, the allegorical symbol of the province of Alsace-Lorraine. 
But between 19, uh, 1870 and 1918, the French draped the statue in black from top to bottom. That was to symbolize their sorrow at the loss of one of their provinces. And they had a big celebration in 1918 when the armistice, armistice came at the end of the war to celebrate the return of their lost child into the fold of the nation. That shows the French at one of their more touching uh, attributes that they are very sympathetic, very emotional people. But what I, the reason I'm telling the story is that at that stage then they decided, what are we going to do with Alsace, about the wine industry of Alsace? The Germans have planted bad varieties, they've used it as a source of cheap wine, and what are we going to do with this country? So they held a big conference in Colmar, uh, and uh, they said, well, what we're going to do with it, we're going to make it French wine again. We're going to re-change the whole picture of that, and they're going to be one of their prides and joys of the French wine industry. And that's exactly what they did. The French are such geniuses at growing grapes and making wines that they took an industry that was second rate, or third rate, if you want to put it, that was simply blending wine, cheap wines, to go to Berlin and East Germany at that time. And they created an industry that now has a big export market. You can buy Alsatian wines right around Davis here. Unfortunately, not in Davis, but near Davis, I you say. <laughs> and, uh, well, you might even get them in a restaurant in Davis. I'm not sure of that. But uh, you can, uh, uh, and people point with pride to what's happened in Alsace. They did this by what Dr. Singleton has pointed out as one of the big quality factors in making wine. They said, let's get rid of the second-rate grape varieties and plant good grape varieties. So they planted Gewürztraminer, which simply means a spicy trimener. Gewürz is, means spicy, and trimener is the name of the original grape. They planted white Riesling, which is one of the best varieties of Northern Europe. And they planted Sylvaner, which is by no means a second-rate variety, although maybe not quite in the category as the first two. They improved their winemaking to produce good wines from these. And as I say, just now they have wines that are shipping all over the world. As a matter of fact, on the 21st and 22nd of the month, there is to be a big Alsatian wine demonstration in San Francisco. A uh, traveling group of Alsatian wine merchants are displaying their wares, and people are going to dinners serving Alsatian wines and so forth. So here is a very good example of what the French are able to do when they put their minds to it. The next region, just the south of it, and a very small region is Chablis. There's only about a thousand acres in all of Chablis, so it's very, very small. There are at least one or two companies in California that make more Chablis than the whole of Chablis. They, from, that should be a capital C here, where it refers to a district now, from now on out, where I'm referring to the district of Chablis, this will be capitalized. When I'm referring to a type of wine like California Chablis, it will have a small C. If you remember that, you'll make about five points on a quiz sometime. Because I'll ask you to identify some different kinds of wines as to where they came from. If they're a small C or a small Burgundy or a small C in Champagne, it means they do not come from the district of which that's the name. Well, Chablis is a white wine. It's a wine that made from Chardonnay grapes, a very cool region, a region that's been plagued by uh, lots of hailstorms, late frost in the spring and so forth. It may be that this is a disappearing type, that there simply isn't enough demand for a tart white wine, rather expensive to grow and therefore expensive to buy uh, in the world today. Nevertheless, uh, we'll certainly keep the name alive in America and Chile and Australia and South Africa and other places in the world as a well-known type of white wine. It's, uh, the French call it a fish wine, and, it's very, and it is very high in acid. It runs almost 1% in acid in some years. Uh, it's very light in color. Now, the, calling it a fish wine is pretty good. It shows that the French people have gotten an idea of the correct juxtaposition of certain wines with certain foods. As I will say in the last lecture, I really don't believe that you have to have a certain glass and a certain wine to go with uh, 
a leg of lamb, and another glass, and another wine to go with roast beef, and another glass, and another wine to go with uh, roast pork. I think that's usually a bunch of nonsense. But in this one case, I think the French have hit upon a very happy combination. As you know, a fish starts to die the minute it gets out of water. Within 30 seconds, the microflora begins to change. Uh, under these circumstances, the fish starts to spoil. All fish start to spoil as soon as they're out of the water. The more acid they are, the less you can smell the spoilage. That's why you have lemons with fish. That's why you have tartar sauce with fish. That's why you cook a fish in a corbouillon made of vinegar and white wine that'll be somewhat acid and so forth to repress the fishy smell of the fish. Well, that's exactly why the French drink it with Chablis, a very high acid wine, and that makes good sense. They've recently developed another wine, which is this wine right here, Muscadet, which they also call a fish wine. As a matter of fact, they're selling a Muscadet on the American market right now called a fish wine. It's another high acid wine that's white and seems to go well with fish. Okay, these, this has very little commercial importance now. But Burgundy, we are in one of the two really, truly great French wine districts. The old kingdom of Burgundy ran all the way from Lyon, a big industrial town, all the way up to the north here, and then there were parts of the <coughs> Duchy of Burgundy in Belgium and even parts of them as far up as, as Holland. It was a big kingdom. And uh, at one time, they challenged the divine right of the kings in Paris, as the, the, the Burgundians were uh, at that time very powerful commercially, and they could afford to do this challenge. They were gradually absorbed into to the French nation as a nation and lost their special identity by a series of marriages, trade agreements, and all kinds of other things. It's called the Cote d'Or, this slope running right here. And there's no gold ever been found there. But it's been called the Cote d'Or for more than 300 years. It's the Cote d'Or, the slope of gold, Cote meaning a slope or a hillside of gold because of the grapes that they grow there and the wine they made there. It's one of the most expensive wines in France, and the land is among the most expensive grape land in the world. As a matter of fact, it holds the record at the present time. A uh, little part of vineyards of uh, one of the white wine districts sold for more than $50,000 an acre a couple of years ago. That's a lot of money for an acre of, of grapes. But there were some extenuating circumstances as to why the company wanted it and so forth but it means that the price of that wine forever will be very high. Divided really into two parts, an upper part and a lower part. We won't go into the details of the difference between them, but the upper part is mainly red. So that's this one right here, Burgundy Red. It's in region one plus, and it grows Pinot Noir as its primary grape. Very good, early ripening red grape. But there's still a little bit of Gamay floating around the growers who don't care about making quality or the growers who don't want to pull up their grapes and so forth, they still grow some Gamay. As a matter of fact, the Gamay does seem to do better down in the wet part of the soil. The slope, the best part of the slope is up in the middle of the slope where the ground is very well drained and they get a little bit better temperature, a little bit higher temperature. Down at the lower part of the hillside, it's uh, colder because the soil is not drained as well. It stays wet in the spring longer, and the Gamay does seem to do a little bit better down there. The white grapes for Burgundy, also the same general area, one plus, are all Chardonnay. And it, but a few people have still got a variety called Aligote. I mentioned this grape right here because we're going to meet with it in the Soviet Union. It's one of the most important varieties imported from Western Europe, now growing in the Soviet Union. And if we have some Soviet wines on the American market in a year or two, you'll undoubtedly see a Soviet Aligote among those, because it's one of the common varieties that they've planted very heavily in the last year. There's nothing wrong with the Aligote. It's just not as good as the Chardonnay. Uh, Chardonnay is a very high quality variety. It gets very ripe and has a very distinctive flavor. I, I've perverted myself at various times that if I had to go to 
that desert island with Marilyn Monroe, and she only would drink white wine. I would take a white burgundy along with me. Probably ought to take some other things too, I guess, my mind, going with Marilyn Monroe to a desert island. But anyway, I should figure up some better, more recent person to go to that with because this generation doesn't even know who Marilyn Monroe was. After all, she went on her honeymoon with Joe DiMaggio at one time. That's, uh, that was a great thing in our time, to go on a honeymoon with Joe DiMaggio for, was uh, just about as good as a girl could do in this world. Uh, well, anyway, I'll think of something else sometime. They are, they are really, truly great wines. I, I'm not a great devotee of red burgundies uh, for a number of reasons. They're a little alcoholic for me. Uh, they have a, they have a um, uh, permissive practice in Burgundy, and it's the only place in France that they do it regularly, called Chaptalization. And they do it practically only with the reds. When there is not enough heat, you see this is only region one, when there's not enough heat and the Pinot Noir doesn't ripen, they can add some sugar. This practice is a very interesting one. This first name here is from a man by the name of Choptal. Choptal was a marshal of France. A marshal of France is the equivalent of a five-star general in this country. He was also a genius at finance. He was a chemist of sorts. He was a great grower in the Burgundy region, and he said when sugar became available, well, that's what we should do to improve the wines of Burgundy in the bad years to add some sugar. I think they add a little bit too much because they make the wines 13, 14% of alcohol. You can't drink a lot of Burgundy. It gives them the sort of warmth and hotness to them that are not quite natural. I'm not saying that I wouldn't drink a bottle of Burgundy if somebody gave me one. Uh, I'm sure I will. My, my patriotism is not that uh, strong that I wouldn't drink a, a good Burgundy wine. And I don't think there's anything second rate about red Burgundies but I don't think they're quite as good as some other French wines that I'll point out in just a moment. At any rate, they're among the great glories of France, the Burgundies are. They are, at the present time, among the most expensive wines that you can buy in the world. And I think they've perhaps been brought to the highest peak of their perfection at the present time. The vineyards are beautifully taken care of, immaculately taken care of, practically manicured down to the last weed. Uh, the winemaking seems to have settled into a format, which uh, I don't see any great changes coming to that. And uh, in general, I think if you are going to make wines out of Pinot Noir, they probably do it as well as anybody in the world does. Now south of there, there's a district that's becoming quite popular at this moment, and that's Bourgeois. This is this little district just south of Burgundy proper. Don't ask me how they pronounce it, Bourgeois, from B-E-A-U-J-O-L-A-I-S, but they do, Bourgeois. It's a red wine early maturing red wine. Comes from that same grape that we met with in Burgundy down on the lower slopes, but here in Beaujolais, it does very well. It makes wines that are mature in less than a year. It has a great fad of people who want to drink the early Burgundies when they are just coming onto the market. Well, I can do that too. I, I, I think that you ought to be eclectic in your drinking habits, not just drink one chateau and one year and so forth, that would be a deadly dull life to just have one wine all the time. But I don't find Beaujolais to be as exciting as some people seem to find it. Something young and fresh is very pleasant once in a while, but it's nice to see a wine that's been allowed to develop more, and Beaujolais do not do that. They're about 11% of alcohol, very early maturing. They have a little flowery nose. If you're tasting Beaujolais, taste it as soon as it comes on the market, within a year uh, after it's been made, and look for that rose-like smell, for the rose-like smell. Rather pleasant, and if you were drinking it in France, it would be rather reasonable in price. But unfortunately, by the time they ship it over here and it gets bottled and so forth, it's not very cheap anymore, or not very inexpensive. Now, there are a number of regions down below here. This is the Rhone River running out of Lake Geneva and going down out at near Marseille in the Mediterranean. The Rhone River has several small vineyards, and I'm only going to point out two of the three main districts today. Well, maybe I'll point out one more. But 
They're all getting warmer now. Bourgeolet is already in two. Hermitage and Chateau Neuf de Pop, these areas right in here. And Cavell over there are in region three, and some years they're in region four. The closer you get to the Mediterranean, the warmer it gets. The reason I mention Hermitage, because here is a grape variety that presumably was imported at the time of the Crusades. One of the important developments from the Crusades was the new vegetables and the new fruits and the new grapes that came from the Middle East with the Crusaders as they came back to Western Europe. You'll recall that it had been some, the Crusades in the 14th, 13th, 14th century had been 500 years before there had been a con con great deal of c contact between the Middle East and the West. And so these added a lot to the French uh, grape picture, and Petit Syrah is the best example of that. A red wine. These wines here age very well, and they're quite reasonable in price compared with Burgundy. If you need an alternative to a, to a French Burgundy, the Rhone wines are the alternative. They're rather full and florid wines. They have 13% of alcohol. You can keep them till your second grandchild is born, they'll still be around if you keep them in any, any reasonably good conditions. Uh, and uh, they, they have real character when they're well made. So much for the Hermitage. Now the Chateau Neuf du Pop brings us to the subject that's the bottom of your lecture outline for last time as to, and I waited till this particular time because I wanna, want to tell you about a man who literally of his own bootstraps, raised up a region. In 1910, they had what they call the Champagne Riots of France in the Champagne district. The growers went out and burnt straw on the vineyards to prevent the grapes from getting ripe that year. And the reason for it was that there was a surplus of wine in Algeria, which was French at that time. There was a surplus of wine in the Midi, which is the south of France here, and they were shipping it up to Champagne and making Champagne out of it. And the grape growers of Champagne were not getting any more for their grapes than the people down in the Midi were getting for their grapes. And the grape growers said, look, it was our grapes that created the reputation of Champagne. It's our climatic conditions, our winemaking methods, and the, our varieties of grapes that created it. Why should they send these things in here and dilute our quality and lower our price so that we're starving to death? So they had their riots of 1910. And from that came the laws on appellations of origin. These are the laws which protect regionally produced products. Now they have a number of them in France. Most of them running to some 28 volumes of detailed laws have to do with wines. But they also have an appellation of origin for chickens growing in a little area near Lyon here called Brest, where the chickens feed on a certain kind of little stone. And you can't put the chickens up on chicken wire or anything like that. You have to grow them out of doors. And they supposedly have a better flavor. They have a number of these appellation of origins for agricultural products. Cheeses, for example, a number of French cheeses. Roquefort, for example, way down here in the south, the rope that is produced down here. Uh, that has an appellation of origin. Only the milk from the sheep of a certain region can be made into Roquefort cheese. So it has an appellation of origin. Well, the laws on appellation of origin do five things. And, and these are applied to grapes and wine, but to, uh, in other ways they apply, different things apply to cheeses and chicken. One, they delimit the region. That's the first thing they do. The region is very specifically defined on the big French maps so that no product produced outside the region can be introduced into the region. Second, they delimit the things that you can grow in that district. For example, Burgundy permits only Pinot Noir and exceptionally Gamay. And uh, Burgundy White permits only Chardonnay and a certain amount of Aligote. Chablis per, 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 permits only Chardonnay. That's the only grape variety you can go grow in that region and call it Chablis. No other variety can be grown and be called Chablis. That's the second thing. Now, since the, these Appalachian of origin wines tend to get 
more expensive as they become better known and so forth. There would be a tendency for people to overcrop. Uh, they would put more grape, they would have Chardonnay grapes, but you can prune the Chardonnay grapes so you can increase the crop a great deal. So in that respect, they put a third limitation on it. They said you can't grow more than a certain number of grapes per acre, or what they actually said, you cannot produce more than a certain number of liters of wine per hectare, or hectoliters of wine per hectare. Uh, that limits the overcropping. But just because the Frenchman might cheat, they then put a fourth thing on it. They said, not only can you not overcrop, but unless the alcohol content gets up to a certain minimum, you still can't call it Chablis, or you still can't call it Burgundy, or you still can't call it Hermitage or you still can't call it Chateauneuf du Pape. All French wines have a minimum alcohol content. If you don't get up to that minimum, why, you can't sell it under the regional name. Well, that was a very um, big thing. The fifth thing they did was they said that you cannot uh, use any new and fancy techniques that just happen to come into your mind. Uh, if the method of making the wine has been uh, set, what they call the loyal and true methods of the region, the loyal and true methods of the region, then you may not use any other methods for that. Now that last one is a little bit too rigid, it seems to me. For example, here in Champagne district, they are forced to use a very inefficient presses because they're the traditional presses of the region. They were all right when you had lots of labor at a dollar a day. But now when French labor is $2 an hour and up, uh, then the, those presses are inefficient. But they will not, won't let them use the more efficient, newer presses because that's the loyal and true thing for them. Well, now that brings me down to the Chateauneuf du Pape. Uh, Chateauneuf du Pape, one of the vineyards there was inherited by a man named Lois. His name is not important. And it was a, it lost all of its reputation since the 18, since Phylloxera came to France uh, in, in 1860. Uh, the, this region here had become completely unknown. Nobody would buy Chateauneuf du Pape and so forth. And he said, well, I know, uh, this man said, I think I know what, let's get an appellation of origin for it. So he spent his whole life, devoted his whole life to improving Chateauneuf du Pape. At the time he started, there was something like 30 or 40 varieties of grapes growing in this small region. Not a big region, perhaps as uh, big as Livermore Valley, but that's not a very big region. Uh, and um, so he said, let's get the varieties down. Before he died, he'd got them down to 11. That was a big, big uh, advance. He said, also, let's agree upon what kind of wine we want to make, a certain kind of red wine. So he set the standards higher and higher and brought the other growers along with him. He was Chateauneuf du Pape in a very real sense during his lifetime. I had opportunity of watching him perform when I attended a congress in Russia a few years ago and have an abiding uh, affection for a man that could uh, get up and, and even make the Russians laugh and sing and dance and so forth, even though he was speaking French and it all had to be translated. It was enough of his personality coming through that uh, everybody could understand what he was getting at. Well, just so the people of this district did. So sometimes a man is more important than anything else, and that's what the little sermon I wanted to preach about Chateauneuf du Pape. Anybody know why it's called the new Chateau of the Pope? Well, that's where, this, where they spent the 70 years in exile when the French kings captured the Pope. They brought them here to Avignon, and they needed a summer place, so they built a summer palace out they call the new Chateau of the Pope out from Avignon, and that's why the district is called Chateau Neuf du Pape now, around this old uh, chateau that was built for the popes while they were in exile. Okay, the most important area production-wise for French wine is the Midi, M-I-D-I. Three of the departments of France are in this district. They make something like 500 to 600 million gallons of wine a year. That's twice as much as we make in California every year in this district. Not one of these wines has a name. Well, one or two do, but practically none of them have a name. They're the wines that the French working class in Paris, in Lille, in Strasbourg, 
Leon, Orleon, and so forth are drinking every day in one and two bottles uh, per day. They're reasonable in price. They're sold by alcohol content. You go along the streets of Paris and you'll see a sign. Vin Rouge, Neuf Percent, D Percent, Ons Percent. You can buy it at 9% alcohol cheap, 10% alcohol a little bit more, 11% alcohol a little bit more. And then Vin Rosé, Neuf Percent, D Percent, Ons Percent, 9, 10, or 11%. Or Vin Blanc, the same way. You can have nine different wines at nine different prices, red, rosé, or white, in a normal French grocery store. You take your own bottles, they take it out of the barrel, you give it to you, and you take it home and drink it. The next day you go and send the children down to get some more. No problem about that. And just like your grandfather used to send somebody down to the, the local pub to get the beer that he was going to drink for dinner that night. I never saw that, but I've been told that it actually happened. And I'm, I, I don't remember pre-prohibition period except some stories about my uncles and grandfather going on hunting trips and things like that. <laughs> okay, so much then for Provence and Mimi D. By the way, the Provence wines are on the American market right now. Those are the Provence is this area on the other side of Marseille. I think that it's better to just leave the Provence wines in France. It's all right to go to Provence if you want to see people without their clothes on, but, and maybe it's all right under those circumstances to drink the wine in Provence. But to bring it all the way over here to America and drink these rather hot, unpleasant, low, flat wines, this is region four down here now, is not going to do, do very much for us. The French are very wise. They don't bottle these McGee wines in bottles and sell them at fancy prices. Why should they bottle these Provence wines? Except we got a bunch of American suckers that are going to take anything that comes from France. So watch French wines when you buy them. Don't pay $3 for a Provence wine, which you could buy for 30 cents a bottle if you were down there at Tropez, watching Bridget caport around and so forth. Um, and any more than you would do that for the Midi wine. This whole advertising campaign, uh, what's called um, village wines or something like that for French wines today, I think is a mistake. The French themselves have never made that mistake, and why should we make it? If the wine is not very good, and it doesn't need to have any bottling age and so forth, just drink it like the French do, uh, right out of a tap, and you buy it every day and drink it. And you pay very little money for it. It's like another accompaniment of your food. It uh, helps to digest your food. It makes you feel good and so forth. Now, the other big region of France that I want to talk about is Bordeaux. And Bordeaux is quite different than Burgundy. First of all, it has different varieties of grapes. Second, it does not practice, except in very unusual circumstances, chaptalization. So the alcohol content is always low. Burgundies, I told you, were 13 and 14 percent alcohol. Bordeaux's are 11 and 12 percent alcohol. Burgundy wines, because of this alcohol that's added and because of this variety, are rather low in tannin. They tend to be soft, velvety wines. That's why many people like Burgundy. Many people don't agree with me on Burgundy. They think that red Burgundy is the greatest thing in the world. It certainly is soft. It certainly is nice and soft. Whereas Bordeaux wines are not. They're very tannic. They're very high in tannin. And they're higher in acid than Burgundy's. Burgundy's are lower in acid. Bordeaux's are higher in acid and higher in tannin. Generally speaking, they may have equally or more color than Burgundy. There are some exceptions to that. But they, they're generally more colored wines than Burgundy wines. Lower in alcohol, but higher in tannin, higher in acid, and higher in color. Burgundy wines are very good to drink when they're two or three years of age. Red wines, maybe at five years of age, are their best from Burgundy. That's not true of Bordeaux. Bordeaux wines need aging. Five, 10, 15, 20 years is not too much for a good uh, Bordeaux wine. So here we have um, two districts that are quite different from each other. Oh, one other big dif difference, too. In the Burgundy district, the French law of inheritance applies. When Papa dies, all the property is distributed equally among the children. So the vineyards are one and two acres. There are places in Burgundy where there are very important <coughs> vineyards where one son will own one row of grapes right up and down the hillside. His sister will own the next row of grapes right up and down the hillside. Very silly, but that comes about through the French law of inheritance. The Napoleonic Code 
guarantees to each child the uh, equal part of the fiscal property. Whereas in Bordeaux, the English law of inheritance applies, and still does, because from 1153 to 1453, for 300 years, the English owned this. And the English law of inheritance is that the oldest son, no matter how dumb he is, no matter how terrible looking he is, he inherits the title, one, and he also inherits all the physical property. The second son, he has to go in the army. The third son, he has to become a, a cleric. And the fourth son, he becomes a merchant or something like that. There's more than four sons. I don't know what they do with them in England. But at any rate, this law of inheritance still applies. So in Bordeaux, you have big estates, 200 acres of grapes in one vineyard. That's, there is no such thing in Burgundy. One, two, and three acres are the normal holdings here. The man that owns the most uh, in the whole district in some 20 or 30 uh, different vineyards has as much as 70 acres, that's all. Whereas there are many, many chateaus down here that the single chateau has uh, 100, 200 acres. And that we call this the chateau system. Bordeaux are usually named after a chateau, named after a vineyard. Whereas in the Burgundy district, the naming is quite different. The naming is usually after the village, and when it's very good, after the vineyard, in addition. And these have an appellation of origin. If it's a, uh, over the vineyard, it has an appellation of origin. If it's over the village plus the vineyard, it also has an appellation of origin. Now, the district of Bordeaux makes about 140 million gallons a year. That's not about half what we make in California. Practically all of it red, a small amount white, which I'll talk about in a minute, but most of it is red. Uh, its district is over here, divided. The whole Bordeaux district is divided into these parts right here. This is Bordeaux. The Medoc. The Medoc is this little peninsula that runs out toward the Atlantic Ocean, the first one that I've indicated up here is the Medoc. Only red wines, that's all they produce in the Medoc. And you can buy a Medoc wine right in here in Sacramento. Uh, you shouldn't pay more than two or three dollars for it because it's going to be a district wine. It could be any wine from that district right there. <coughs> Sometimes you'll find a wine that will say St. Julien. That's like a township used to be in this country. As a matter of fact, the French call it a commune. That's not some place where hippies live either, by the way. St. Julien is one of the best communes of the Medoc district. It's a whole township, or like a county we'd call it now, that also has a right of an appellation of origin. So you can call it Medoc, or you can call it St. Julien. If it was good enough, and it came from this particular district here. <coughs> right next to the Medoc is Grands. Terrible name for a wine. I don't know why they continue to use it. Grands is a wine that has a gravelly soil. That's the reason they call it gravelly. Grands. The, the varieties are the same. Cabernet Sauvignon is not the only variety. A lot of people are always comparing Bordeaux wines with California Cabernet Sauvignons. That's a mistake. It's a mistake psychologically and philosophically, but it's also a mistake because Cabernet Sauvignon is only one of the varieties that go to make up Bordeaux wine. They have, in addition to that, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot, and uh, uh, even other varieties. But anyway, these two districts on each side of the town of Bordeaux have those five varieties. This, is, this town of Bordeaux is right, right between these here. They make both white and red wines in the Graves. Graves has some white wine. And here's the white wine down here. The variety of grapes there are Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. These are both good varieties. We grow them in California, and you'll find wines labeled with them in California. Incidentally, we also grow the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Merlot in California. You can find both of them on labels now. Now, the other two red wine districts are on the other side of the river. The, the river here splits into two parts. The Dordogne up here and the Giron down here. Inside one is saint Emilion, And the one to the west is Pomerol. 
Pomerol is an example of a district that has literally pulled itself up by its boots in this century. It didn't have very good classification in the last century. Wines did not sell at a premium. But some growers got together, planted good varieties. The same varieties we had, plus the Cabernet Franc. Another kind of Cabernet, but with a small L, Cabernet Franc. And uh, they have uh, improved their reputation so they get as good a price as the Medoc does now. Quite good prices. Only red wines, just red wines in the Pomerol Saint Emilion. I don't know how to tell the difference between Saint Emilion and Pomerol, frankly. I think I do know how to tell the difference between Medoc and Saint Emilion. The Medoc wines are a little more tannic than the Saint Emilion. They say, and this will give you a clue as to what the differences are in the Bordeaux district. They say the saint Emilions are the Burgundies of Bordeaux. Now, I don't think that's really true, because they're not as high in alcohol, and they're not as low in tannin as Burgundies. But they are higher in alcohol and lower in tannin than the Medocs. The Medocs are sticking right out into the Atlantic, and it's much colder here in the Medoc than it is up the river here, up the Dordogne River, where saint Emilion is grown. Well, whether you like uh, these wines, oh, there's, there's one other wine, Sauterne. Sauterne is a uh, white wine, and it's sweet. And how it's produced and so forth, I will, I will take about, talk about next time. Just allow me one more minute, and we'll fi uh, finish this list today. The Loire River is the longest river in France. It comes way down here in the middle and flows out to the Atlantic. And all along it, they produce a number of different wines. I've only given you two of them here, but I think they're interesting because the varieties are different. The first of these is Bouvray Angers Saumur, and I have especially great affection for it because I, I got my teeth into drinking French wines by going on a wine congress tour there in 1937, and there was lots of wine and it was all free. So I shall never forget the Bouvray Angers Saumur district. Chenin Blanc is the variety. Chenin Blanc. Don't ask me how they pronounce it. Chenin. It looks like it should be Chenin, but it is Chenin Blanc. And then down toward the end of the river, this new district, which they've just been developing as a substitute Chablis, or as a Chablis, the type of wine, called Muscadet, has nothing to do with Muscat. Now, I'm sure to get that in the examination. I'll ask somebody, what is Muscadet? The correct answer is it's a white wine from the lower Loire River that's high in acid and made from Merlot grapes. Not Merlot. Melon, excuse me. <coughs> M-E-L-O-N. Melon, just like melon when they say melon. Muscadet, made from melon grape. It has no muscat curd at all. It's just a high acid, tart, very good with fish wine. Those are the two Loire wines that you should Remember, now I didn't say anything about Tavel, and I marked it right here. And there's a good reason for talking about Tavel to finish this lecture. Ernest Hemingway said that one of the things that men have brought to its greatest perfection as an artistic achievement is wine. There's a wonderful quotation from one of Hemingway's 1920 stories to that effect. Well, Hemingway came to that conclusion by drinking nothing but Tavel. He wrote, the sun also rises, and for whom the bell tolls, and so forth, certainly under the influence of at least one bottle of Tavel a day. Good, good enough excuse to drink Tavel, I would think. <laughs>